nonprofit organizations and for-profit organizations are far more alike than either party would imagine, right? And, and we actually do ourselves a disservice, particularly in the nonprofit world, by kind of issuing or like saying, hey, you know, that's business stuff. That's not for us. That's not how we do it. Nonprofit, even in the technical definition of the word, does not mean that you don't have profit. It means that your primary objective is not a profit motive. If you're a nonprofit with no profit, you will not be a nonprofit for very long, right? Like you have to do it. Now their sources of funding is a little bit different. They may be engaging in, an, in a nonprofit activity and receiving funds from ex the outside, but that's just that activity. That's not the organization. And mm -hmm. so when, what nonprofits do is they often sell themselves short because of that. Welcome, folks, to this episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. Today, my guest is Scott Ritzheimer, Ritzheimer sorry about that, Scott, who is the CEO of Scale Architects. Scott, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. No worries on the name. Uh, when people get it wrong, they tend to add syllables. So I've been written to Meyer. Like, it's like, where did you find that? You know, so it's, it's not an easy name to pronounce. Uh, I, I can't slate you for it whatsoever. Uh, so no problem there. Happy to be here. I've been looking forward to this. Uh, it's a little later in the day here on the East Coast of North America. Uh, and so I've had some time to look forward to, uh, to our conversation today. It'll be great. That's awesome. Likewise, I thought I was going to nail it, but you know, that's okay. Well, what's equally as important as how to pronounce your name is all of the great stuff that you've done in the world, in your community, in your work. Um, so why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about Scale Architects and your previous life uh, that uh, contributed to where you are now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the most common questions I get asked is when they hear about what I've done is, how old are you? Because I look like I'm about 22 years old. Uh, you know, I've, I've practiced trying to like make my hair gray or do something. I, I don't know what, exactly what to do about that, but I do. I've, I've got a young face, but I, I've had a lot of life that uh, I've had the opportunity of experiencing. I've helped start about 20,000 different organizations. Uh, I launched and ran and sold a business over about a 13 year period. We, we hit $10 million a year, which was just fantastic for us. Uh, and I've had now the opportunity for a few years to, to step into the consulting world. Most of that is spent helping folks learn the lessons that it took me a really long time to learn on my own. Uh, but some of that is the opportunity to work with some really large, really successful organizations. And so in a, a relatively short period of time from a career standpoint, but feels like forever, you know, from a life standpoint, I've had the opportunity of really getting to see the patterns that exist inside of organizational uh, life and, and to feel those uh, firsthand and, uh, you know, to be able to walk it and see it happening at scale in real time was just a fascinating journey for me. And one that uh, I, I've only really recognized primarily in hindsight. Uh, but, um, but anyway, yeah, so a, a lot in a very short period of time. And, uh, and in light of that, again, having the opportunity to do similar work to yourself and, and consult with folks, uh, I just have the joy of helping people learn things the easy way as opposed to learning them the hard way. Yeah, absolutely. So I definitely want to ask you about like all of those lessons learned and, and working with all of those different organizations, but I'll ask you a slightly different question. It's like, what drives you? Like, what is the thing that like, when you woke up and started on this journey to say, hey, I want to do this. This is the path that I want to be on. And, and this is the kind of opportunity I see both for myself and then the people around me. Yeah, that's something that's been pretty dynamic um, and, and has changed quite a lot over time. I, I would say, um, one, uh, my faith has a big part in that. And, and, uh, and so that's a big driver. But by and large, I, I got into the business world by accident. Uh, I, I needed a job, you know, and I found one. And I ended up working for a company that three months after I started got sold. Uh, systematically but unintentionally destroyed, uh, repossessed, and relaunched. Hmm. And, and uh, in what's arguably one of the most painful processes that can happen in the business world, uh, because a lot of people were let go during that time, few people had to declare bankruptcy, it's just tragic, tragic experience, I fell in love with business. And, uh, and what really drives me through all of that, through to today, and what I've gotten closer and closer to as an individual is I love building the things that build things. 
Uh, I love getting people to work together to do whatever it is that they do best. And what breaks my heart is how often that's not the case, how much resistance there is just in the natural course of getting two people to move in the same direction, let alone 200. And, uh, and so I, I hate seeing the friction and the delays and the challenges that come when folks who are great at what they do don't recognize the necessity the necessity of building the thing that's going to allow them to do that and do that at scale yeah so uh i i'm so curious about that experience and those those reflections because in my life i literally wrote a book that says entrepreneur i can't even get it behind my head lessons i learned the hard way so you don't have to so i think there's a lot of that in there but if we go back just very briefly on that experience of the business that got sold repossessed what were some of those those takeaways or those lessons that just kind of stick with you that you're like, ooh, like that is going to be burned into your brain? And it might not be kind of conventional, but it'll be a thing that you never have forgotten. I would say uh, I could probably come up with a bunch of them, but the one that stands well and truly above all the others that has that truly shaped the way that when I had the opportunity to come in and rebuild the organization as a re-founder, if you will, uh, that was really my guiding light through the whole thing was the original founder had built a successful uh, business, but he had not built a company, mm. right? He was the primary asset of the organization. And so when he sold the organization and left, there just wasn't really anything left. Sure, there was another you know, dozen or so people. There was a website. There were you know, sales reps. There were all of the things that we think are a company. But the reality of it was he had never built the thing that could do it apart from himself. And so when he sold it from day one, it was destined to fail, right? With, with what the expectation was of the buyers, with what his expectation was as the seller, everyone thought this is a vibrant business, but what they didn't realize was he was a vibrant entrepreneur. And those two uh, were still knit intrinsically to one another. And coming out of that, and, and what I actually spent a lot of time working with, uh, especially younger entrepreneurs, is helping them to balance between building the thing that you want to run, right? Building the thing around your strengths, but also building it so that if you do want to sell it or hand it off one day, it can survive without you. Now, part of that is just the nobility of, I want it to be around when I'm gone, right? For most entrepreneurs, it's, it's like another child. It just doesn't happen to have their blood in it. Uh, but even then, you know, it, you've got enough blood, sweat, and tears in the process that it's practically related to you at this point. Uh, and so most of them don't want to just see it fall to pieces afterwards for obvious reasons. But even if you take the kind of idealism out of it, you, if you want to sell something and get a premium on it, if you want to get a, a high multiple on it, you want to sell something that's going to thrive even if you're not there. And, uh, and so that was really the biggest one was that doesn't happen automatically. And just because you're doing millions of dollars in sales a year doesn't mean that you've actually solved for that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's the difference. And I, it's humbling as a CEO myself going through that process and looking and saying, hey, do I have a, a good job? Do I have a business? Do I have something that's scale and going to support? Uh, like some people come in, they say, hey, like, what's my exit plan? Some people don't want to exit. Like, I want to do this until I'm older and gray, or you can borrow some of my gray if you'd like. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's it's a lesson that you have to learn through that process. Uh, great books, like Built to Sell is a great book. Uh, uh, the Entrepreneur Myth, great book. And of course, I know that you've got books that talk about that. So I do want to touch on that. Um, but like building the systems to support you and not being successful or being successful despite yourself. Because I see a lot of entrepreneurs that have built great businesses, but if they weren't there, like holding it together by that little thread, it would fall apart. And so uh, if you're listening and that's you, make sure you get it with Scott. Uh, before I ask you about your scale architects, faith-based organizations, you know, it, it, when you were working with Start Church and like doing all of that work and helping those organizations, what would you say? And as somebody who, as we mentioned in the pre-call, sees it and has an anecdotal, is it the same as every business? Is it like fundamentally there's a key, like I'm sure there are key drivers, like what makes those businesses special? What makes those businesses unique? And to those of our listeners that are in those organizations, whether it's a business or not, uh, what do you want them to take away? So that was a big question, but I'm think you got it. 
Yeah, yeah. So uh, what I would say is that uh, nonprofit organizations and for-profit organizations are far more alike than either party would imagine, right? And, and we actually do ourselves a disservice, particularly in the nonprofit world, by kind of eschewing or like saying, hey, you know, that's business stuff. That's not for us. That's not how we do it. Nonprofit, even in the technical definition of the word, does not mean that you don't have profit. It means that your primary objective is not a profit motive. If you're a nonprofit with no profit, you will not be a nonprofit for very long, right? Like you have to do it. Now their sources of funding is a little bit different. They may be engaging in an, in a nonprofit activity and receiving funds from ex, the outside but that's just that activity that's not the organization and mm. so when what nonprofits do is they often sell themselves short because of that so uh, you know i worked with a lot of these organizations as they're getting started and i can tell you that entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs if they're starting out in the nonprofit world they're starting out in the for profit world they use different language uh, they have kind of different goals but they go about those goals almost the exact same way, right? Uh, they're highly, you know, and, and it's a weighted word in nonprofit, but they're highly evangelical about their vision for the organization, right? Uh, they are both uh, big dreamers. They're both starters. They they uh, actually need an element of risk to move forward. They uh, they both have a vision for a better future for a, a, the group of people that they're trying to serve. They they both have a better vision or a bigger vision for the a better way of doing whatever it is that they do and so they they really are you know cut from the same cloth if you will uh what what tends to be different is uh that nonprofits tend to uh tend to work off of the biggest one is that with their value creation and their uh their revenue generation are distinct activities that's the biggest kind of fundamental difference. Now, that actually doesn't show up a whole lot in terms of organizationally and structurally. Um, but what it does do is it complicates the math a little bit. Uh, where in a business world, you can just say, hey, if we have a great product, people are going to buy it. Well, in the nonprofit world, that's not necessarily true. You have to be good at your product and you have to be good at an independent revenue generation. Now, those two go hand in hand, right? If you give to a nonprofit that isn't very effective, you're not going to give to them for very long, but they are more separate than what you'll find in the business world. Uh, so, so that creates a little bit of a difference in terms of language. You don't talk about sales, right? Uh, you don't really talk about uh, a, a, about creating something for revenue generation, right? Uh, you don't really look at your profit margin on your activities in the same way. So there are some mechanical differences, but the structural differences are not there. Second biggest uh, difference between the business world and the nonprofit world tends to be the use of volunteers. And, uh, and what I can tell you is organizationally, that is a, a distinction without a difference. If you are organizing groups of people to go after shared goals, it doesn't matter if they're paid or volunteers. It matters that you have to have sound leadership and management skills and the right organizational structures to move those people in the same direction. Now, how you motivate them is a little bit different, but what you expect of them, the common mistake that nonprofits make is I'm not paying them. I can't expect a lot out of them. And what I found is the exact opposite is true. When people are volunteering their time, they would rather do that with a group of people who are gung ho for whatever it is that they're going after. They don't want to give their time with a bunch of slackers, right? And so if you don't have a high standard of, of excellence, a high expectation, it's not because you have volunteers, it's because you're not leading very well. And, and, and that's hard news, but it's just true of, of the nonprofit mentality. If you think of yourself as not profitable instead of a nonprofit, you're going to get yourself in trouble, particularly in those two areas. I can't overstate how great a distinction of those two was. It was super clear. I, I really appreciate it just in terms of the directness. And I think that it's a, a misnomer that a lot of nonprofit organizations go into. And especially when people have their board hat on and then their entrepreneur hat on, if they're in various organizations, it's not different. The drivers are, are different. Uh, and, and some of the things you have advantages, pros and cons. On the one hand, you know, you have very well-intentioned people in the nonprofit world, uh, but also it means that they especially need that leadership. Uh, right. So I, I just really love that. And then 
you hear the term like family business a lot, especially with smaller entrepreneurs, like we're a family. No, you're not. And it, having that distinction in there, but it can get even more blurred with community. But here's a, yeah. a, a couple key takeaways that I really appreciated, Scott. It's like one is just reframing that whole that whole perspective. For profit, not for profit. I think both should be more like the other. Um, but if you're running a nonprofit or mission based organization, reframing how people think about it, uh, the the idea or the thought that people are selling themselves short absolutely agree and i couldn't emphasize that more um and that like the value creation and revenue being distinct activities i think that's that's critical to say hey like we don't necessarily sell something and nonprofit people don't even like the word selling but from my perspective the ability to actually create more value and sell helps you do your mission more that's so exactly. if you're re- yeah if you're really mission focused you want to be doing that um and then the use of volunteers like they want to be used, they want to create an impact. And if you don't have that direction, you're selling them short. So yeah. uh, anything else I, I missed there about your, what you no, said? No, that's good. The The other dynamic that happens is less organizational. It's more people uh, driven. And and one of the things we spend a lot of time with, with both worlds on are the multiple leadership styles that show up. And what you tend to find uh, in the nonprofit world is a lot of a style that we call the synergist. Hmm. These are very who driven people, right? Uh, they value consensus. Uh, they uh, they're kind of the Bill Clintons of the uh, of you know the leadership world, where it's just very much like I hear you, I see you, uh, and and just his overall persona, taking the politics out of it, but just the way that he shows up, and uh, and what can happen, especially for smaller organizations, which most nonprofits have less than ten employees, uh, and most of them even have less than ten volunteers. So vast majority of that world are very, very small organizations. And one of the things that's true in both nonprofits and for-profits is that synergists are not the ideal leader for those environments. They have too much of a focus. Uh, Those environments being which environment? Both, but small organizations, whether nonprofit or for-profit, there are actually other leadership styles that will get a bigger return. And so where we see uh, the reason that we see uh, us being soft on volunteers, the reason that we see uh, a de-emphasis on revenue generation in the nonprofit world is less to do with the structural realities and more to do with the leadership styles of the people that we bring in around, particularly around the founder. So our founders typically tend to be kind of visionary types, right? They're the ones who who are willing to take the leap and make the thing happen. And then what we tend to do in the the for-profit world uh, more often than in the nonprofit world, we we can mess this up in the for-profit world and do quite frequently, but where we see these smaller organizations succeeding uh, with more success, you know, with greater regularity in the for-profit world is because they more readily embrace what we call the operator style that ruthless finisher, get stuff done, right? Uh, Walk through walls to make it happen. That tends to run kind of cross grain to this this nonprofit ideal of consensus and mutuality. and, And we create a false dichotomy between the two of them. And so what you have in the nonprofit world, especially early on is an overabundance of synergist types and an underrepresentation of operator types. And if we were to make just that one adjustment, uh, if, if you're starting a nonprofit, if you're leading a nonprofit and you start to look at, am I getting people who are consensus driven or, or uh, completion driven, right? Just getting more completion driven individuals on board, which isn't natural in the nonprofit world because we've built this thing around consensus. It's gonna take a little bit of time. It's, it's gonna a little awkward at first, but if you can drive toward completion driven individuals, you will find that a lot of that other stuff is actually just byproducts of, of that imbalance, right? You'll find those people have no problem going out and generating revenue because they believe in what they're doing and they, they don't see, have that same conflict that a more synergistic, you know, Know, kind of idealistic uh, individual may have. Uh, and so what's really at the root of it in the nonprofit world, this is faith-based and not faith-based, but nonprofits in general, is that they overvalue consensus and they, they lose their operator leaders because of that, or they never create a place for them in the first place. Hmm. 
Yeah, that makes tons of sense. And it's interesting. So as a, as a facilitator, so we facilitate strategic planning, we look for alignment. And so I am a consensus based person, that uh, part of me. The other part is a project manager, a finisher who loves to get stuff done and, and just making sure it gets across the line. And yeah. so getting that alignment is critical because it does speak to that leadership style that you talked about earlier. Like if you're not leading, you're just going for a walk. So you need to make sure that people know where they're going, yes. but you also need to be making progress. And if you're not making progress, even the most uh, ambitious and highly driven people, in fact, the most highly driven people are going to get frustrated because nothing is going to move and they're going to wonder, Hey, what the hell are we doing here? Uh, for That's lack it. of a better word, pardon. Yeah. Um, Scott, so you, we've talked so much about like what you've seen, what you've learned, and I so appreciate it. And so what I'd really love to ask is like, what are you doing now? Because I am, I touch a lot of people and I'm so convinced that you get it, you see it, you understand it. So I don't usually say, hey, plug yourself explicitly, but I'm happy to hear because I just know you get it. So who are the people that you love working with? Who are the people that you help? Who, like, what are some of the projects you're working on without giving any details, just so Th those that this is resonating with can easily like get in touch. And then we'll kind of use that as a segue yeah. to finish out today. Yeah. So the whole dream behind scale architects was to help organizations to recognize what they need to do to grow at each stage of the journey mm -hmm. uh, where my organization got stuck. Uh, and we name these stages, but in the third stage, which is something that we call whitewater that happens to all successful organizations, my business got stuck there. And I saw a lot of the organizations we started get stuck there and, and I was seeing it happen, but I couldn't figure out why it was happening or what to do about it. We were stuck there for several years. It cost us several million dollars. Uh, it cost me having to fire some of my best friends. Like it, this was this is a painful experience. It it made us second guess whether or not we should just wrap it up and you know go to half the size that we were and just make it easier again. Uh, it made us wonder if we really could grow to the the, the extent that we wanted to. All of these, I now know, were symptoms of just being in this normal stage that everyone goes through. But all of them felt like we had failed. Right. Or we were on the cusp of failing. All of them felt like, you know, we, we had just gotten lucky. We didn't create the success we had. We just got lucky with it. And now this is proof. We can't figure this out for, for the life of us. And uh, and so that stage, that stage is called whitewater. And, and what I now know that I didn't know then is it's not the result of doing something wrong. It's actually the result of doing all the right things in earlier stages. But it's not recognizing that the game has changed. And so what we do when we're working with folks, and we work across industries, about half of our work is in the, the church and nonprofit world, another half of our work is in the business world, we're industry agnostic, you know, obviously. Uh, but what we do is help people to recognize which of the challenges they're facing are systemic, they're just, they're part of this life cycle, right, and have to be addressed, and which are the ones that we can actually ignore for a moment, because there are other things that we can focus on more. And so by doing that, by focusing specifically on the right things at each one of these stages, uh, we can help organizations to grow and scale with way less energy expended, uh, way less you know, kind of tumult and, and heartache, and, uh, and to help them to really grow as an organization. And so we're not doing a lot of work on maintenance type organizations. We're not helping kind of tune the finely tuned machine. We're going in and help turning you know, speedboats into warships, right? We're, we're going in and, and helping folks to make those kind of internal transformations as an organization to build the systems and structures that are needed to scale those organizations up. So if you're a church going from one campus to five, or if you're a coffee shop, you know, going from being a coffee shop to being a chain of coffee shops, if you're uh, a, a manufacturer in the Southeast to being able to, uh, to go nationwide and start exporting, like those scale up kind of 10 X movements uh, are the, the types of things that we help organizations to create. It's not just kind of polishing the apple or, or shining up the machine. It's we, we recognize that what we're trying to do is so much bigger than we are today that we can't possibly get there the way that we are right now, but we don't really know how to get there. We've got a map for that. And, uh, and that's what, what we do. I spend my time about half working with organizations to do that and half training other coaches on how to do that as well. Sweet. I love that, man. I think that's so cool. Uh, and it's, 
just a way to create impact in the world. So it's great to see people that approach the, the visionary, like, because it is very visionary when you get to that place, but you got to have like the meat behind it to be able to say, Hey, like brass tacks, how are we going to move this forward? And I think yeah. that balance is critical. And then teaching people to reflect like where they sit in that and to have people come in and build the support system around you to compliment, because there's no problem yeah. being a visionary and there's no problem being an operator. The thing is, if you have one or the other, um, you're going to, you're going to miss out. So, uh, yeah. Scott, where can people get a hold of you? Where can they connect with you? And yeah. uh, all over social media. Uh, I wish I could say I was the only Scott Ritzheimer, but my dad stole that title first. Uh, so <laughs> you'll have to figure out which one of us is us. I'm the one who looks like he's 22. We'll put it that way. Uh, but no, if you go to uh, scalearchitects.com, we've got everything there. We've got a couple of free assessments that are super, super powerful. Uh, we use it with all of our clients and go deep on it, but you can use it absolutely for free right there on the website. There's one that'll tell you what stage your business is in. There's another one that'll tell you what leadership style you have. So it's not like a lot of the other, you know, where you got to pay a hundred dollars to get some, you know, fancy report. Uh, we just get right down to brass tacks and, and you can use that for yourself, for your entire team. Uh, and, and what you'll find, if you take those two assessments, you'll see how those two need to line up. And a, a big question that folks are asking is what leaders do I need to move forward? And those two quizzes together will solve that problem for you. Uh, it's fantastic. Awesome. Thank you, Scott. It's been a personal pleasure. So much info today. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I hope you have just an awesome rest of the week. And, and thanks for the time today. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. Thanks, Anthony. Folks, my guest today has been Scott Ritzheimer, who is the CEO of Scale Architects. Connect with him, take an assessment. And as you go on your journey of creating impact, whether that's in the for-profit world, the nonprofit world, or somewhere in between, recognize you need to build the great team around you to complement you so that you can do great things in the world. So I appreciate you listening today. This has been the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. My name is Anthony Taylor. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening wherever you are in the world. And I'll see you next time.